Hello everyone, thank you very much for coming here. This is my first panel as I said, and this is like about four times as many people as I actually expected to see sitting in front of me. My name is Giancarlo Lemus, and today we're going to be talking about the history of Japanese superheroes. We're going to be talking about the men in... Like, oh, now you want to open twice. <laughs> we're going to be talking about all the men and women that led up to the creation of the current modern day crazes of these anime made of her, like My Hero Academia or One Punch Man. See, we're going through a superhero renaissance right now because we've got characters like... and We have the things like the MCU just... Bogarding the box office in the United States, and in the end, Japan, we have My Hero Academia and One Punch Man being some of the biggest anime of our time at the moment. But the thing is, we really don't, it's weirdly led to not m as much of a resurgence for other Japanese superheroes. Not to mention the fact that One Punch Man and My Hero Academia are basically Japanese takes off of American superheroes, of American capes. I mean, All Might is basically a Rob Liefeld character, One Punch Man is whatever he's got going on. Um, but if you guys can remember back how it was when JoJo's Bizarre Adventure came out, once everyone finally clued into the JoJo references, is this a JoJo reference? Became a meme, and for good reason. Like, we've got several decades of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure cultural references that have been embedded into anime by people who grew up watching and stuff that we simply didn't know about because nobody read Manto Audio until right about now. And it's my belief that if Ultraman were to get popular tomorrow, we would have another couple of years of, is this an Ultraman reference? Coming out. So uh, I wanted to make this panel so I could educate people about the history of Japanese superheroes so they could hopefully have a better cultural understanding of the things that led to the creation of modern day superheroes. Just so you guys know who I am though, uh, my name is Giancarlo Lemos. I've, uh, I've been into anime for like the past 20 years. I love tokusatsu so much, I wrote my own tokusatsu novella five years ago. It's Mass Cyborg Pyro. You can find it on Krobo right now. And um, I have a common Rider, uh, I have a, uh, a meter driver belt. You know, I, I like the superhero times. You know, I, I watched Pretty Cure once on several occasions. Let's begin actually with the first superhero here, um, Ogon Bat, aka Golden Bat. I want you guys to just soak in this guy's design. He doesn't look like a bat, he doesn't care, he's got a gold skull, he's got a golden skull face, he's dressed like a musketeer. There's that thing in the background that you probably would have seen in the first title page, the guy riding the, the UFO. This guy isn't just the first Japanese superhero, he's quite possibly the first superhero ever made, debuting in 1931, six years before Superman. This is kind of like how all my college professors would fight between whether or not the Chant Canterbury Tales or Don Quixote was the first novel, ignoring that the tale of Genji existed. We've got all the people going Marvel or DC, and I'm here going Toei. Um, my, uh, Golden Bat is a Kamshibai character. Kamshibai is actually a Japanese art form. You've probably seen it from characters in anime who are supposed to be out of touch. It's having a wooden frame and a bunch of oil paintings you sliding it out as a person narrates what's going on in the painting. This was the medium that debuted uh, Ogon Bat, and from there he actually moved on to anime, manga, and a bunch of other adaptations. He is so old that, unlike Superman, he's actually public domain. See, public, see, ladies and uh, boys and girls, before a company named Disney came along, public domain was a thing that a lot of stories could go into, wherein society owned the character, and you could do whatever you want with the character. Unfortunately, nobody really seems to be doing anything with Ogon Bat. The later depictions of him aren't in public domain, but the original version is, and he's largely just trivia at this point, which is kind of sad. It looks he, like the shadow predates Ogon Bat by like perhaps six months or something. The shadow predates Ogon Bat? By like six, six months. Rats, spoiled again. <laughs> Curse you, Lamont Cranston. <laughs> uh, Alec Baldwin screwed me over. Anyway, um, Ogon Bat is an Atlantean. He has the ability to turn into a bat, and his scepter is actually his great power. Although he's invulnerable, he can cut anything with his scepter, or create earthquakes, or, they, or even shoot beams of light. The villain in the story is Dr. Natsu, or Dr. Mystery, if you have to speak in English, who is an intergalactic crime lord who creates a crime ring in Japan. The rest of the story is probably typical, you know, an archaeologist finds him, whenever his daughter is imperiled, she sheds a single tear, and Ogon Bat shows up to save the day. Ogon Bat actually sacrificed himself in a noble battle to defeat Dr. Natsu at the end of the day, and, well, like I said, he's largely been forgotten to history. It's kind of a shame. We really do need an Ogon Bat reboot someday. The next guy is this dude, Supergiant. Not actually a giant, but... 
Oh, hang on. Let me look for my notes here. There we go. Yes. Known in the United States as uh, Star Man, uh, Super Giant debuted in 1957. He was kind of like Tarzan or the old black and white Superman shorts in that he was a series of theatrical shorts. The very first theatrical superhero in Japan, in Japan as a matter of fact. And you can actually see his stuff in English. This guy is MST3K fodder. He was actually, his uh, nine Japanese shorts were actually adapted in the United States into a series of four movies that you can actually find on YouTube. The titles are Atomic Rulers of the World, Invaders from Space, Attack from Space, and Evil Brain from Outer Space. A lot of space stuff back in those days. Um, Starman is an artificial human created by the Emerald Planet who travels through the world and holds bringing justice to whatever planet he finds. He's invulnerable, he can detect radiation, and he can speak any language. That's kind of a bad stat spread if you ask me. He's also got those three robots that are going with him. And unlike what his name might imply, he can't actually become a giant. That's another superhero we'll be talking about later. <laughs> Much like Ogon Bat, um, Supergiant has largely fallen by the wayside, and he's just trivia. Again, like, if you're interested, you can find his old Starman stuff on YouTube. I was surprised to find it there. But other than that, he's largely faded to history, and it's ultimately very tragic, I think. Quite a loss. Now, let's flash forward a couple of years. Um, who here knows about Gonagai? Quick show of hands, Gonagai. Okay, who, so... There was a reboot of a very famous Gonna Guy series in 2017 of one of his older characters, and this was a very controversial reboot. Like, I don't think we were ready for all of the sex and violence that this reboot came about. It was only in streaming in the United States, but it was a great series, and I want to talk about this character for, with you today. This character is... Not Devil Man. <laughs> this is Cutie Honey, another one of the many superheroes that Gona Guy made, and also something that your mother definitely did not want you to read. This was nothing but TNA all the way. Gona Guy, what a man. Cutie Honey is an android created in the image of a dead scientist's uh, fallen daughter. She has a machine inside of her chest that can actually convert oxygen molecules into any material she might happen to need. She uses this to create a wealth of disguises for herself as she takes on the Panther Claw organization, a group of monster girls, basically. Like, it's going to guy. Everything has to be horrid and sexy at the same time and just leave you very confused. Cutie Honey has actually been very relevant over the course of the years. She's pretty much a pillar of magical girls, even though she's not really a series aimed at girls. She debuted in Shonen Champion magazine, after all, and I had to censor her with the Mahoro icon because she's naked under that. Like I said, your mom did not want you reading this. Um, there have been a lot of Cutie Honey adaptations over the years, though, like Cutie Honey Flash in the 1990s, the live-action Cutie Honey movie made by Evangelion creator Hideaki Anno, and my personal favorite, Re-Cutie Honey, the Cutie Honey adaptation that was made to complement the live-action movies made in 2003 by Gainax. If you guys want to chart the course of Trigger, I definitely highly recommend you watch Re Cutie Honey. It looks fantastic. Imaichi directed one of the episodes, and for anyone who watched um, Kill a Kill and liked how things ended up with uh, Mako and Ryuko, Cutie Honey's got food for you. Um, as I said, she's kind of a pillar of magical girl shows, and even though she's kind of not meant for girls, and even though she's kind of like lewd. A lot of her actual, a lot of her uh, aesthetic and style has basically informed a lot of like sexy anime since then. Like, there's definitely a bit of cutie honey in Kill a Kill, and then there's definitely a bit of cutie honey in any weird sexed up superheroine that we see in Japan. Now we're gonna go back a couple of years from here after Cutie Honey. We're gonna go from 1967 to a year called 1966, where we meet the real super giant, ladies and gentlemen. It's the big one. We have Ultraman. Established in 1966, Ultraman is actually a spin-off of a TV series. The, uh, Ultraman was originally proposed as a character to appear in the Ultra Q anthology series in Japan. In fact, his name, Ultraman, comes from the Ultra Q series. After a series of redesigns and reinventions, instead of the bird monster Bengular, we have Ultraman, a silver and red alien monster from the M7, uh, sorry, M778 uh, Nebula, who is basically an intergalactic policeman who crash lands on Earth, damaging the body of a science patrolman, Heidel. They share the same body and fight giant, giant uh, a series of giant monsters, many of whom are incredibly iconic and have their own fandoms to this day. It's like if people remember the rapping pumpkin from, from uh, Power Rangers and decided, yeah, that's the guy I want. 
And many of these monsters are so famous that they're getting sequels and like reinvented versions of themselves in modern day Ultraman shows. That's nuts. That's like having like Goldar appearing in Power Rangers to this very day, which doesn't happen because they gotta bring back Jason David Frank. Also, uh, this guy is uh, Ultraman's older cousin. Sorry, uh, Gridman's older cousin. If anyone remembers Gridman? Does anyone? Did anyone here watch uh, 4S Gridman? Yep. It was good. It was good. Very good. Yes, it was good, wasn't it? Baby done done, baby done done. I can't begin to illustrate just how massively influential Ultraman is, especially considering that he's still continuing to this very day with shows like Ultraman Root, which you definitely should be checking out. As I mentioned, the individual monsters in Ultraman are so iconic of themselves that they themselves are enough to be referenced, like Mako over there who is cosplaying as Jamila from Japan. The whole thing where you pull your shirt over your head? In the United States, that's doing the Cornholio. In Japan, that's doing Jamala. Um, there's also a lot of Ultraman and Dragon Balls you can see. Um, Ultra 7's main attack was the Ice Slugger, where he would just simply throw the weird crust on his head as a boomerang weapon. Chi Chi did that in her first debut in uh, Dragon Ball. There's also the uh, capsule technology from Ultraman. See, Ultra 7 had capsule monsters, tiny little giant kaiju that was sealed in tiny capsules. Snap the capsule, the monster appears. This wound up being the inspiration for the capsule technology in Dragon Ball. It also wound up inspiring a company called Game Freak to make a series called Capsule Monsters, about people with king kids running around, getting monsters in capsules, and training and battling them. They couldn't use the uh, Capsule Monster name, though, because, you know, Super IQ had that name, so they renamed it Pocket Monsters. Yeah. <laughs> when I rehearsed this with my coworkers, they didn't catch on to that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Pokemon is still continuing today to the tune of being the best and highest grossing franchise worldwide to the tune of 90 billion smackers. So safe to say, we would not have had Pokemon if it has not been for Ultraman, bless his heart. Also, that guy in the middle there, that's Kinikuman, and yeah, he's an Ultraman reference. As you can see, he's actually doing the Ultraman growing pose where he's just stretching into the camera. I didn't realize that until last night, actually. <laughs> Let's move on ahead now. Let's move in a couple of years to another superhero. Remember when I said that Pokemon was like the highest grossing franchise at the tune of 90 billion? This is the sixth most, uh, this is the sixth highest grossing franchise worldwide to the tune of 60 billion. This thing has outgrossed the MCU and the Disney princesses. And Star Wars for that matter. This is another su superhero, fantastic one, super powerful. Prepare yourselves for Anpan Man. Established in 1973, Anpan Man is a superhero who debuted from a series of children's books. His ability is that his head is a sweet bean bun. He can go to people who are hungry, tear pieces off of his head, and feed them to you so you don't go hungry. It... Yeah, this is a kid's book. It is disturbing, and yet this is a character who's appropriate for like toddlers in Japan. There are museums where you can go, and there's a bunch of Anpanman stuff, and you can buy buns in the shape of Anpanman's head. <laughs> it is fully possible for him to give off so much of his head that he has no head, and the baker has to bake him a new one. This is actually a thing, though. If he uses too much of his head, he loses his powers. He loses his strength and the ability to fly, so he has to get himself a new head. Like I said, Sixth highest grossing fr multimedia franchise in the world to the tune of 60 billion, and Guinness world record for most characters at 2,300. At the time of counting, there are way more to this very day. Anpanman also has 30 films, 13,000 episodes of anime, and a villain by the name of Baikinman, who is a bacteria person from another planet, whose ability is he makes things rot by touching them. The lowest stake superhero with the most gruesome repercussions. And, like I said, as you guys might have seen, he is the reason we have One Punch Man. I don't know if you guys noticed, but yeah, One Punch Man, he's basically just a palette swap of Anpan Man, as you can see in the costume. Also, the names are supposed to be a reference to Anpan Man, One Punch Man, as you would say in Japan. And, you know, they're both bald. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you guys might actually like this next one. It's a superhero team created by a man by the name of Shotaro Ishinomori, quite possibly one of the greatest comic artists to live, very much the Japanese Will Eisner. This is a team of people who've had their humanity stolen by them by an evil organization and fight worldwide to protect everyone. This is... Cyborg 009. My boys, I... I... 
I cannot tell you how cool it was to stay up at like midnight on Cartoon Network all those years ago to see the first episode of that uh, Cyborg 009 reboot back in the day. Awesome stuff. Established in 1964 by Shotari Shinomori, as I said, this is a story of an international team of individuals kidnapped by the evil Black Ghost Organization, turned into cyborg super weapons in a bid to make super soldiers to sell to the heist bidder. Black Ghost wanted to create soldiers that could, um, that could take, uh, capitalize upon the new frontier in battle, outer space. So he created nine cyborgs with various superpowers like flight, super strength, breathing fire, breathing underwater, telepathy, telekinesis, and super speed. Also, the one guy with the big nose, he can shapeshift into anything. His name is literally Great Britain. <laughs> yeah, his name is Great Britain. You don't ask what the guy from, pa like, the guy from Africa, his name is Puma. Like, this is still one of the most diverse superhero teams I've ever seen. Like, DC and Marvel are way behind, because we have two men from Asia, one African man, four Europeans, and two Americans. One of the Americans being a Native American, as a matter of fact. Like, where do you see that? The MCU ain't doing that. The Avengers ain't doing that. The cyborgs have been rebooted various times over the past couple of years. Like we've had, like the most recent one is actually being re-released recently by uh, Discotech Media. I highly recommend that. Justin Sudeikis, the producer for those DVDs, he went through hell and high water trying to get that stuff produced. No joke. There is an eleven-page report of all the crap he went through trying to get those Blu-rays out there. That and like the 2000 Cyber 009 series, really, really good anime. Also, if you guys are interested, I, know, uh, I don't know who here likes Devilman Crybaby, but there is a Cyber 009 Devilman crossover on Netflix, and they cut straight to the point. If you want to see whether the, um, 009's acceleration mode can keep up with uh, Devilman, first episode. They do not waste your time. As I mentioned, um, the Nine Cyborgs are some of the most influential characters made. Like, I specifically. I specifically chose not to talk about Super Sentai, or Kamen Rider, or Skullman, or any of the other Shotaro Ishinomori superheroes, because it all comes back to Cyborg 009. Um, Kamen Rider 1 is basically the one, like, is basically one cyborg from 009. Um, the idea for them has also inspired later superheroes like Metal Dinter over there, and the, and the very designs for the cyborgs have also inspired a lot of other later anime characters. For example, 002 over there wound up inspiring Pizza from Galgaigar. Do I have any Galgaigar fans in the audience? You must be getting tired of losing your hand all the time, man. <laughs> I don't know if anyone also remembers uh, Super Robot Monkey Team Hyperforce Go, but... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as you can see there, the flight suits are actually inspired by the nine cyborgs. The whole World War II aesthetic is very much inspired by Cy uh, Cyborg 009's design. I definitely recommend those ma that manga. It's extremely political. Ishidomori was not afraid of getting extremely political with his stories and outright naming politicians as the pro as basically um, outright naming po politicians and attacking nationalism as a threat to the world. This is actually why I think the nine cyborgs are international. The threats that they face aren't just criminal organizations, it's nationalism itself, and that kind of thing just ruins everyone. There's an episode of the 009 anime from 2000s where, um, the, where the African cyborg goes back to his village, and it's basically war-torn because Black Ghost has been hiring his villagers as mercenaries. Well, even in uh, with Gull Ranger, all the generals for the villains were coming from different parts of the world. So a guy here over here, I don't know if you guys heard that, but um, in Go Ranger, he's saying that the, the generals from the villains were also very international based, which is a very good point as well. Great stuff, but again, like I can't stay too long because we have to move on. We have to go ahead a couple years to a superhero team from, Yat from uh, Tatsunoko. Yatterman. Now, I wanted to talk about more Tatsunoko characters, but I really don't have time to talk about Kashurn and Tekaman and uh, the Gachaman. Breaks my heart. I know I announced Gachaman, but I couldn't talk about them because I wanted to talk about Yatterman, and I didn't even want to talk about the Yatterman characters. I wanted to talk about their villains. Yatterman is basically Tatsunoko looking at Hanna-Barbera and saying, hey, let's do that, but with superheroes. The story of Yatterman 1 and 2 and their dog robot Yatter 1, it's funny because Wan is what the sound that dogs make in Japanese, so it's Yatter Bark. They're basically going around the world and trying to stop the evil Doronbo gang from getting all the fragments of the Skull Stone, a massive, an ancient relic that would lead them to the greatest gold deposit in the world. 
They appeared in uh, Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, if anyone remembers that old game. I certainly do. I certainly miss it. Please bring it back immediately. I need it. But like I said, I don't really want to talk about Yaraman so much as the villains from the series. Yar um, Dorombo, Boyaki, and Tonzura. Because you've seen them before. They are very much an archetype. See, the, um, this team, the Dorombo gang, wound up being the face of all the villains from the subsequent Taimokan series that Tatsunoko produced. The idea of the tall, aggressive, and sultry villainous, the tall, skinny, and effete, delicate guy, and the short, squat, chubby guy, is a stereotype of superhero teams and villains that you've pretty much, that's pretty much been used a lot in the years since Yaraman debuted. A lot. A lot. A lot. A lot. <laughs> but yes, that's why I said you've seen these guys before. That's basically the idea behind Jesse James and Meowth. And it's weird to think that Jesse James and Meowth are old enough now as characters as the, the Dromo Gang was when Pokemon started as an anime. It's wild. And in Japan, at least, they've had the same voice actors for years and years. Not so much in the United States. Alas, Eric Stewart, we will never hear you make your weird moans as James. Four kids did him dirty. So, okay, we're going to skip ahead to the 90s now, because we got to talk about another team of characters. We're going to talk about the most radical team of superheroes from the 1990s, and I know that you guys know who I'm talking about. Color-coded teenagers fighting evil monsters from outer space. We're going to be talking about... Sailor Moon. <laughs> Why? You guys don't like Sailor Moon? <laughs> but yeah, um, I could have talked about Power Rangers, but again, like, we already talked about Cyborg 009, so I figured it's time to actually showcase another team of superheroes. It was weird to me when I was making this, um, when I was making this panel, I realizing, hey, Sailor Moon's a superhero too. She's just a magical girl. Kind of like flipped my world. But yeah, um, Sailor Moon. Um, one of the most, what do I say? Like, it's one of the most influential shoujo manga ever. Like, it reinvented magical girls, because before then he had stuff like Creamy Mammy, where the magic was a girl's turning into an adult to solve her daily problems. Here, it's girl is moon, reincarnated moon princess. Her and her friends have to fight evil space sorcerers. Also, they, they're actually punching and hitting each other. It debuted in 1991 as the manga, although the manga was actually a spin-off of a prior manga by creator Naoko Takeuchi called Codename Sailor V. The Sailor V character was actually brought back for this as Sailor Venus. Um, it has a couple of very legit fighting games, and it's a pillar of LGBT fandom, largely for the infamous cousins Haruka and Mi uh, Michiru. I had to bring that up. I had to. I just had to, man. And... There's also another thing I think that made it really popular. See, in most other shoujo series, you'd have very wispy, delicate uh, women as your protagonists. But Sailor Moon, I don't know how to say this, but Usagi Tsukino, she's kind of a trash goblin. She eats too much, she gets terrible grades, she's very disobedient. She, her, her, the first time she fights a monster, she doesn't win by virtue of strength or courage. She wins because she cries so supernaturally hard the monster just gives up. Which is, which is funny because Tuxedo Mask says crying will not make you succeed. Well, wouldn't be the first time Tuxedo Mask is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> also, Sailor Moon doesn't know how to use a computer, and it's the year of our Lord 2019. Just be patient with her, she's trying very hard. And no, there is no Sailor Earth. Sailor Moon is also quite possibly one of the most influential anime of the 1990s, right up there with Dragon Ball. Like, when you think anime from the 1990s, what do you have? You've got Pokemon, you've got Dragon Ball, you've maybe got Gundam Wing if you're one of those people who really like Gundam Wing, and then you've got Sailor Moon. It's so influential that it basically inspired whole other shows. The dynamic for Sailor Moon can be seen in My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. A lot of Sailor Moon is in Steven Universe itself. It's, e it's easier to find artists who weren't inspired by Sailor Moon than it is to find artists who were. Did I say that? I do that a lot. I'm very sorry. Yeah, but like if you read uh, Babstar's Batgirl of Burnside comic, yeah, you can see Sailor Moon in the back in the panel over there in the background because Babstar is a Sailor Moon fan. Right on. And also, like, it's pretty much broken through culture. Like, I don't know if you guys remember that um, ice skating show that came out a couple years ago where that lady actually just did Sailor Moon. Give her some credit because she started the whole thing waking up. She was lying down on the ice for that. I don't remember, did she win a gold medal for that? 
Because she was robbed if she didn't. But yeah, Sailor Moon pretty much changed the face of Magical Girl shows ever after. Um, it, re it introduced the idea that Magical Girl shows could be more about action instead of just like just wispy, um, just wispy uh, girls transforming into adults to solve their problems, which pretty much led us to cu um, cutie. Sorry, cutie, honey. Uh, to yes, thank you, Freak Cure, which in and of itself has become a juggernaut. I mean, like we're still getting Freak Cures to this very day, and they're pretty much just carrying that torch. I, this is literally the first time I thought about it. There really does need to be a pretty cure Sailor Moon crossover. Who's with me, right? Yeah. yeah, that would be awesome. Also, you know, there's definitely a bit of Sailor Moon in Monica Magica because you know Sailor Moon itself can also be very dark. Let's not forget, you know, that first season, all the Sailor Scouts died one by one, and Sailor Moon was left alone and had to re resurrect them all. The original manga was also going to be a lot darker. Like Takuchi's original plan for Sailor Mercury was a woman, uh, was a cyborg woman whose limbs had been blown apart in an explosion or something like that. Her editors told her. Dude, this is for kids. You can't go that dark. And then the season one finale happened. Yeah, actually, that's going to be the end of our presentation for today. Like I said, there are a lot of characters I wanted to talk about for this, and I just really couldn't because there's just way too much to talk about when it comes to these guys. I definitely want to do this panel again. But, um, oh, wow, you still have a lot of time. Um, if anyone of you guys have any questions, you know, I'm all ears, actually. Yes. If I was a superhero, what would be my name? Yes. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be a superhero. I'm pretty sure I'd be that one random guy sitting on those Toei brand plastic chairs getting attacked by Putty Patrol monsters. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a cosplayer I follow on Twitter, uh, Amber or something rather. She works at the Toku website. She actually appeared as one of those random people in a crowd running away from monsters in one of those recent uh, Super Sentai movies. Uh, anyone else? Yes? What's your favorite uh, Japanese superhero power set? Power set? Yeah, like set of powers. Oh, okay, alright. That's not that's a good question. I've never actually really thought about that. Because like I'm mostly all about the common rider guys, you know, just being able to strike a pose, transform into a weird kung fu bug man and just, you know, help that little kid who's lost or, you know, just fight that weird bug monster. I'm all about the common rider guys, honestly. Okay. Anyone else? So Oh yes, oh, sorry, yes. You? Who is your favorite common rider? I think about that long and hard. <laughs> no, but um, I love Kamen Rider Black. It's a very tragic series, and um, Tetsuo Kuroda's acting in that is just simply phenomenal. It's a complete 180 from the regular tone of other com prior Kamen Rider shows, and you know, he, I think, was, no, he doesn't, he wasn't the first to have a scarf, but it was just a very emotionally involving show. When the whole thing ends, you just want that guy to have a peaceful life. No wonder Black RX is so much more lighthearted. But as far as the recent shows, you know, I'm definitely in for guy. I definitely loved uh, Forze. You know, Meteor's my man. Um, anyone else? Yes? I did not watch Samurai from Lego because I know that that show was just a trash fire, but like an incredibly entertaining trash fire. I, I've heard great things though. Um, yes, ma'am. Are you thinking about uh, Kame Bazooka? Yes. Kame Bazooka. So, um, and you're saying, or Kaiju teaching morals to kids? Well, yeah, because they save children, they save, like, they talk about the environment, they save the day, quote unquote, but they technically qualify as superheroes? Well, see, considering that they're in, in their original context, they were agents of Shocker, I probably wouldn't count them as that, but they're, like I said, with Ultraman, a lot of these kaijus become so popular they become characters in and of their own and basically have fandoms to this very day. I mean, just look at the Boltons or the Dadats from Ultraman. Like, people love those guys. There is that one um, Ultraman Christmas commercial they made that has like all these Ultraman characters going through Christmas stuff and you see like the Dadats or something stumbling drunkenly out of some place or like someone crying in the snow because they don't have any presents. It's a very cute commercial. But yeah, like these are just fully fledged characters, icons in and of themselves. I wouldn't consider them superheroes, not until, you know, Kaime Bazooka gets his own spin-off series where he defects from Shocker. Yes, sir. Uh, so what do you think of Harris? That was, that was Tatsunoko trying to get into the back of the anime superhero game back in the 2000s. See, here's the thing. I was never able to watch Karaz, and I know absolutely nothing about it. I've heard it's good, and like what I've seen it is incredibly stylish. I don't even think it's still in print anymore, is it? Yeah, Netflix DVD still has it. 
plan? Like Netflix's DVD plan. Okay. I own the DVDs, and I have to say they're one of the few things that I'm glad that I own on DVD. Like it is incredibly stylish, especially when you consider like how early it was in the 3D animation like, kind of evolution of animation, it, it looks beautiful. Stylized animation is definitely a staple for Tatsunoko. Like, any, even in some of the recent reboots, like, you look at Kasher and Sins, and, like, they got the Pretty Cure art, I think that was the, uh, hug, the hard catch Pretty Cure artist to design um, Kasher for that. It looks fantastic. Tekka Man Blade, you know, that intro by Masami Obari is phenomenal. But, yeah, no, man, I really don't know anything about Kara's, you know, it's a bit of a shame of myself, but, oh. Yes? So, um, you mentioned earlier that you've caught a whole bunch of superheroes for time, and now that you have time, maybe you can give me a short list of runners-up, because I'm fairly new to anime, like my first anime was Soul Eater, and it was like a sin to watch anime in my house, so I'm trying to like educate myself. Well, I would definitely recommend, uh, Gachamon, particularly Gachamon Crowds, that's a recent reboot, very recent, you can find it easily, of the Gachamon team. Gachamon were a team of bird-themed superheroes who fought the evil organization Galactor in who would steal technology to use it for evil. This was a recurring theme for a lot of superhero shows in the 1960s and 70s, like using its technology responsibly for the good of society and not for, you know, war. The first episode, in fact, had Galactor stealing plutonium from a nuclear power plant to use to make nuclear warheads. Gachamon Crowds kind of continues that, but the technology in question in that show is social media. It's a very interesting show, and the villain is fascinating. The problem is that the show came out pre-Gamergate, so in the climax of the show, when they dox the genderqueer character and the main character, who, bless her heart, she means well, tells the character, it's okay, just turn your back on the internet, nothing on the internet can hurt you. You know, August of 2014 kind of showed us that that's not how that works. It's still a great show, I definitely highly recommend that. And if you want some of the older stuff, um, oh yeah, no, Yadarman Knight. That's actually a sequel series to the Yadarman series. I forgot to talk about that. It's very interesting because it shows what happens in the continuation of the Yadarman world. The Yadarman heroes are established as rulers for all their good deeds, and they're the rulers of Yadarman City, where their descendants are rich through no merit of their own, and the descendants of the Doromo gang are perpetually impoverished because their ancestors were villains. It's got a lot to say about how society frames people who come from bad backgrounds. It's a very interesting show. Also, it was the one show to finally change the voice actors for the Doromo Gang. Now, any depiction of the Doromo Gang uses the voice actors from Yadarman Knights. Um, I highly recommend that. Also, if you're into older stuff, Tekken Man Blade, like, the intro is honestly kind of better than the show itself, but the show itself does pick up, and it's very, very stylish, very good stuff. Quick little note about, um... Yadaman and, um, and Gachaman. Last year's artist guest of honor, Yoshitaka Amano, did character designs. He was here? Last year. Oh man, I wanted to come here to, uh, last year, but I couldn't because I got laid off, so I couldn't afford a ticket. No. He did two live painting sessions and let people film them so you can view them on, online. They're on YouTube. Thank you for bringing that up, man, seriously. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yes, yeah. I wanted to talk about Tiger and Bunny actually, and I wanted to mention. Like, thank you for reminding me about Tiger and Bunny because I well, that was another show I wanted to mention. It's a very, it's another very interesting show, but again, it's kind of like superhero, like Western superheroes through a Japanese lens. Like, I know that um, the Wild Tiger's ability is basically making himself bigger to an extent. Am I on the ball? It's sort of like he increases his stamina, strength, and speed okay. by ten times for ten minutes. Okay, so it's not so much that he's actually literally becoming Ultraman, he just, you know, has all for one. Yeah. For ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. Like, again, like, again, like, it's basically Western superheroes through a Japanese lens, which is kind of interesting. You'd think they'd have, like, one Ultraman reference in there or something. But yes, Tiger and Bunny, I think, is a definitely a great show. Kotetsu is a good dad. If, you know, if Kotetsu was my dad, things would be different around here. <laughs> you had, yes, sir? Have you, are you familiar with the Garo series? Garo. So yes, Garo, for those who don't know, is actually a tokusatsu series, like a live-action special effects series that's aimed more at adults. Ergo, there are more topless women running around. 
it's actually very horrifying. Like they actually lean into the horror of being turned into a monster, and they establish that killing one of these monsters is a mercy killing to the person that they used to be. I haven't actually seen any of Garo, but like the suit design, the special effect, they've done so much Garo in the past couple of years. Pick one, watch it, you're gonna have a fun time. The best way I describe it is it's like Kamen Rider meets Devil May Cry. That party is gonna be freaking crazy. Man. <laughs> Uh, any further questions? Um, the new Ultraman anime and manga that's been going on, kind of looking back to the stuff you covered earlier. Where yeah. it's, like, what do you think, the thing of that? Because it, it, it's taking the old, taking classic Tokusatsu superhero Ultraman and definitely viewing him through a, through a modern superhero lens. Um, it does the thing I hate with reboots. It looks at a character who is a symbol of hope and optimism and says, okay, how can we make it grimdark? Like, the show opens up and like, it's established as, a, as an actual sequel to the original Ultraman series. Like, it establishes itself as the true continuation to all that stuff. And then it establishes that Hayato was affected by his exposure to Ultraman, granting him some latent superpowers. Ultraman, a symbol of hope and optimism, who protected humanity and felt so much compassion for this human that he injured that he shared his body with this human, his influence with Hayato is referred to as the curse of Ultraman. And then, like, also, they give Ultraman a secret costume in that he's basically an Iron Man. Like, I'm not a fan of it. Like, the people who made that Ultraman manga, they have a tradition of making heroes grimdark. They did the same thing with um, Kamen Rider at one time. And like they, they had to stop it because you know Toei gave him a cease and desist. Thank you, Toei. But yeah, like their thing is basically taking classic Japanese superheroes and making them grim dark, which I'm just really not a fan of. Especially when it comes to like characters like Ultraman, who's again the ultimate symbol of hope and optimism. That's kind of the beauty of Ultraman. Like a lot of bad stuff happens in there. The episode with Jamila is very gripping because it ends with a um, it ends with the main character, very well, one of the characters very much like angry and resentful towards the United Nations who are basically abandoning an astronaut to die on an alien planet. But even then, um, this was a science patrol. This was an era where we could use technology and have a peaceful world. We could call upon the stars, speak to aliens and stuff. It was hopeful stuff. It was the hope of the 1960s. Why are you do using this as a platform to make something grimdark? I don't understand that. It's just not my thing. It's like Man of Steel. Like, why are you going to take a symbol of hope and make it evil? I don't get it. What's wrong with it, man? Um, do we have any other questions here? All right. So, um, yeah, we're 15 minutes ahead. I definitely could have talked about other superheroes, but, you know, um, better leave them waiting, wanting more than leaving over stuff. So, um, I want to thank you guys for coming here, honestly. Like, I did not expect to having nearly as many people show up for this. I'm, like, super grateful for all of this. Definitely a great experience. You know, I'm definitely going to be making more panels in the future. So, um, you know, thanks a whole lot, and, you know, have fun at Comoricon. <laughs>